All right, you guys remember, don't you, some of you, when you, when you were, before you had kids and you were looking at other people's kids and they had a big gob of snot right there on their nose and they kept, you get down there close, close enough to lick and I told my wife, I said, our kids will never look like that in public. Now let's make sure, and that wasn't just a statement, it was an order, like, it's not going to happen. But uh, trust me, it happened. It happened and a whole lot of other things. When I first came here almost 20 years ago now, we had two kids. We had a four-year-old, and she's here today. She's not four anymore. And uh, we had a three-year-old, Jordan and Taylor, and we didn't have any other kids. And uh, before that, I was serving two churches down in Mercer County. I had two churches, and I would be doing a circuit ride every Sunday. I would preach at 1 at 10 a.m., and then I'd jump in my little Geo Metro. Remember the metros? And I'd boogie up the road and preach at another one. In the evening, I would reverse the order. So two churches. And uh, I was also in seminary. I was traveling two and a half hours to Johnson City, Tennessee, uh, Elizabethan area, Emmanuel Christian Seminary. And I was uh, studying for my Master's of Divinity. So I did that two days a week. And I had two churches. And I was also a young National Guard chaplain. So I had a pretty full plate. On top of that, my wife was working. She was working uh, teaching school like she teaches now in Putnam County. She was teaching in Giles County, Virginia. And I remember uh, suggesting that we have a third child. Well, after I got up off the floor, we started reasoning a little bit more about that. And um, days were tough. I mean, they were really tough. Parenting's hard work, isn't it? I mean, it'll bring out the beast in you. And sometimes it'll bring the best out in you. And it's tough. It's tough today, I think, more so than it's ever been at any other time in the history of civilization. Now, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, I'm I'm not basing that on anything but my own observation and my own personal experience. I believe it's harder to be a parent today than it's ever been in the history of civilization. I mean, we didn't have, when I was a kid, the, the technological distractions or access to perversion or uh, all the stuff that kids have to deal with today. Even at young ages, they're dealing with this stuff. My wife, again, third grade teacher, and the stuff that her kids have to deal with out there in the world. And sometimes at school, it's just terrible. It's hard to be a parent. It is a tough job. So I can remember days when uh, this daughter here, this oldest daughter, she was a little colicky when she was a baby. And you know what I mean? Anybody, can you feel me on that? Uh, I don't know what it was, if it was just breathing air that made her like this or whatever. But uh, I used to carry her around. I'd hold her feet right here, her legs, and I'd have her stomach against my shoulder because someone said if you put pressure on their stomach. And I can remember marching around the house And when my wife got home from work, because I was being dad the three days a week that I wasn't in seminary, I was playing dad. Not playing, I was dad. And I can remember almost tossing Jordan to to her mother out of frustration. It was just so hard. It was hard. Hard days. So when we came here, the elders, I expressed to them, you know, I would like to be able for my wife not to work. I want her to be able to stay at home because... We would like to have a third child. And uh, they said, well, how much will it take for you, for your wife, to stay home and work? Now, that's kind of what you want to hear, isn't it? How much is it going to take? And I'm like, oh, I can't, you know, I can't go too high. I can't go too low. So I threw a figure out there, and they said, okay. I'm like, oh, man, I didn't go high enough. It wasn't a great big amount of money, but it was enough for us back in 1996 for her to stay home. And two years later, uh, we were visiting the women care facility down there in Taze Valley. We were done with hospitals and epidurals. I mean, I just didn't want any more epidurals. I just thought it was... You with me? I thought, my wife's tougher than that. And she was. So we had that third child with, all we had was flat Pepsi. There was a flat Pepsi in the refrigerator down there. And that's all we had. And we went into the uh, birthing center at like 10 or 11 o'clock that evening. It was a Sunday night. I still remember it. By 6 a.m., probably sooner than that, we were back home in the bed with our daughter. My wife changed the oil in the car that afternoon. (laughs) Now, she probably could have, but that's how great it went. And 
we haven't stopped since. Well, we stopped having kids, but we haven't stopped parenting since. And I'll tell you, that was just like yesterday. And that daughter graduates from high school uh, in, in a week or two. And I just want to tell you, for those of you who are up here on the stage today, middle school is only a few days away, and just a few months is college, graduation, and marriage, and it goes by so fast, doesn't it? And it's hard work while it lasts, but you've got to put some effort into it. You know, the problem with, for us as Christians, too, is that there's not, even, there's not even a great picture of what parenting, Christian parenting, looks like in the Bible, we don't have a complete picture. There's no place to turn to and say, this is what a perfect family looks like. I mean, the, all the Old Testament people, the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and David, and, and Solomon, they all had their issues, big issues. I mean, you can't point to their family and say, this is it, this is it right here, because they had major, major flaws, and part of their flaws were in their parenting. And they were playing favoritism, they were, they were lying, they were, uh, they were doing all sorts of things that we wouldn't want Christian parents to do today. You go to the New Testament and there's no family, perfect family in the New Testament. I mean, you have these verses that we're going to pluck out today, a few of them, but there's no perfect family. That's what we uh, have to admit. Even the family of Jesus, I mean, contrary to what some movies and books will say, we only have one story of Jesus after the nativity narratives, after the birth narratives. There's only one story. There's not a bunch. There's only one. And it was when he was about 12 years old, and he was in the temple. You remember the story? I mean, this is, this is what kind of parents Jesus had. You know, they're walking home, maybe their day, or I can't remember what the Bible says, a day or two into the journey, and somebody looks at the other one and says, hey, honey, where's Jesus? I don't know. I thought he was with you. I mean, what, I can understand a parent losing a human child, but lose Jesus? Well, how could you lose Jesus? And they did. He was back at the temple. They had lost sight of him. But, you know, we dads, we know how that, that happens because we get so focused on stuff that we don't even know there are kids in the room, especially if you give us a remote control. I mean, get out of the room is what we say, Right? So uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not easy. It's not easy. There's no perfect picture of it. So I can't point you to any one place. I can pluck out some verses. And I am going to talk a little bit about some things, some cultural lies, really, is what they are. They're cultural lies that a lot of people are believing. Now, I'm not, I, I have good kids. And every time I say that, there's a little bit of reservation. There's a little bit of, oh, my goodness, because there's still a lot of time for them to make some major blunders in their life. But I think I have pretty good kids, and, and I, I'm not saying we're the perfect parents. We're not. We made a lot of mistakes. I don't have time to tell you those today. And we did a lot of things wrong. We had a lot of uh-ohs and oops, and let's try to do that. And, and there's even days today when I'll think, man, I wish we had done that differently. I wish we had done this instead of what we did. I wish we had done something instead of doing nothing. And, uh, but, you know, we can't go back. You can't change the past, but I can help you. And there are many of you who've been parenting longer than I have, and you can help uh, others to be a good parent. I'm so proud of our families. We have some great young parents today. You know, when I was growing up, it was like the mom's job to parent the kid when the kids were little. I still remember it like it was yesterday. We had this blue lava lamp on our TV. How many of you had the lava lamp? I mean, the old ones, you know. Yeah, and they were on the TV, and I, I broke it. I don't know, it was horsing around. I was in high school, I believe, and I broke it, and it just it went everywhere. And, you know, I always wondered what it would look like if you broke that thing open, and I got to find out. And my mom was so mad. I mean, she was so mad. And I'd seen my mom mad before because she raised me and my brother and my older sister and my younger brother, and I'd seen her mad, and she was so mad she didn't want to touch me. I mean, there was a time when, when my mother spanked me, and I was at crying when she spanked me with a belt. Y'all remember what a belt is? And I was so proud of the bruises I had on my legs later. I had bruises. She said, oh, what happened to your legs? I said, you did this to me. <laughs> now, today, she would, you know, she'd be in jail. But I can still remember that. But I broke that lava lamp, and she was so angry. She looked at my dad, and she said, he's in high school now. It's your job. And so I'm like, oh my, 
the shift of disciplinary power just happened. And my dad didn't do anything. I'm like, where, where has this been for the rest, you know, all my life? I wanted this in middle school. So, uh, you know, it's tough work, and it's, it's got to be done together. And I'm so proud of our young families where I see moms and dads really helping each other and doing the work. And it's just, uh, it's, it's a great time to be a parent. It's tough. It's the toughest time, but it's a great time to be a parent. There's never been more material, more resources, more help, and more awareness of what it takes to be a good parent out there. So... I just want to encourage you in that. But I don't want you to believe any lies. Now, this is, the, this is our main text today. It's in 3 John. There's only one chapter in 3 John. It's verse 4. And I want you to read this with me, okay? Let's read it together. Here we go. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. What a great verse. Now, I'm not sure John was talking necessarily about literal children as much as he was talking about people he had had a part in mentoring, but it, it's still the same. As a parent, we find our joy, we, we get some satisfaction when we know we've done a good job and we see our children walking in the truth. But there are some lies surrounding that. Let me tell you these lies. I want to talk about them just for a few minutes. First lie people are buying into, having children will make me happy and fulfilled. Listen, I want to tell you, you don't have to have children to be happy and fulfilled. In fact, I often wonder what life would be like if I didn't have any children. I mean, you probably only have pets if you want one. You probably don't have to hide your lawnmower keys or your car keys or the Oreo cookies. You probably don't have to search for the uh, remote control. There's a lot of things, a lot of benefits I could see to not having kids. But I'm a dad. I'm a dad of three daughters, now four daughters, and one Haitian son. And I'm just saying I wouldn't trade it for anything. I love it. I love it. And Father's Day is about a month away. <laughs> right? But you can't buy into this lie that having children will make me happy and fulfilled. It's not going to. Now, you might say on, at first glance, oh, Dave, I don't believe that. Yeah, but you better be careful because sometimes parents act like that. It's like their whole world. They put everything they have into, into this child. They do everything. They, they, they get everything. They provide everything they think this child could ever want because this makes me happy. And when I see that child open that gift and that 15th Christmas gift, that, that brings me fulfillment. But it won't, will it? That's a lie alive. Proverbs 127 says, children are a gift from the Lord. May your quiver be full of them. But I want to tell you, that was in an age where, where uh, you know, you worked on the farm, you had to work, and, and there were a lot of mouths to feed, but there was a lot of help out there, too, to do the, do the work. I think a lot of parents today would say, my children have not made me happy. I talk to so many parents now of young adult children who discover their children are addicted to some drug or, or something else and their heart is broken. They're like, I don't know how this happened. I don't know how it could steal from me. I don't know how they could treat me this way. I don't know how they could treat their grandparents this way. And it, and it is not happiness. It is not happiness. And unfortunately, some of those parents have to lay that child to rest in a coffin. And that's not happy. Listen, if you're going to depend on your children or somebody else to bring you happiness and fulfillment, you're going to be depressed. You're going to be down. Your life is going to go up and down and up and down. No, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 6, this great passage to parents, and this is a wonderful passage for you to read if you are a parent because uh, God tells Moses, you know, tell the people that this is what they need to do as they're moving into the new land. And he's telling these parents that you need to teach your children every day and use the everyday things of life as uh, object lessons to remind them what, what we are and who we are and why we do what we do and why we believe what we believe. But before he gets into that, he says, but don't ever forget this, that you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You see, here's the truth. Here's the truth I want you to know uh, for this lie. The truth is that true happiness 
and fulfillment come when we devote ourselves first and fully to the Lord. Look, it's, it's really true. I know that when your kids are little, you're like, ah, this will never end. They'll never get out of this phase. They'll never, they'll never get over this. They will. And it'll happen so fast. Don't miss the opportunity to live out your faith in front of your kids. Not your devotion for your kids. They'll get that. Let them see your devotion for God, for your Savior. So don't buy into that lie. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So here's a second lie that some people buy into. They think that my children are a blank slate and they only need love to thrive. Now this comes from some people maybe who've gone through a divorce or they, they have some kind of a broken relationship. And I know we live in an age where kids are shuffled like a deck of cards from house to house and, and where, uh, you know, there's, there's divorce and there's boyfriends and there's girlfriends and kids, you know, little kids are just confused and it's so hard for them. And we often use the excuse, uh, you know, kids are resilient and, and, and kids are tough and they'll understand, they'll get over this. All they need is love. And that sounds good, and it even sounds biblical, but it's not. They need more than that. Now, unless you define love by what I'm going to say, your kids don't just need you to, just, I'm just here with you, honey. I just love you. Now, they need that. They need that. But they need more than that. Because here's the truth of the matter. They're not a blank slate. Your kids are born with a nature to sin. Psalm 51.5 says, Surely I was sinful at my mother's womb and at birth. Now there's some theological debate about whether kids are born sinners or if they're born with the nature to sin. Now I happen to believe that they're born with a nature to sin. That children are innocent, but at some point in their life, when they willfully disobey, they become sinners. And I don't know any kids that that hasn't happened to. I don't know any kids who've, who are still walking that life of innocence and perfection. In fact, it seems like if they're male children, they'll get into trouble faster. Is that true? Anybody raising boys out there? I don't know if that's true. I doubt it is true. Because we are equally human. And if, if, you, don't, if you don't believe what I'm saying, and your kids are a little like, no, they... This kid's a blank slate. They, they're always going to do right. Just wait. Just wait. And, and you will discover one day that they made a bad choice. Maybe it's, maybe it's mouthing off to you or talking back to you or maybe it's touching something you told them not to touch or, uh, or, or leaving something you told them not to leave there. or Whatever it is, we all know this is true. Whether, the, the debate doesn't even matter because we, we are all part of the sin problem, aren't we? We're all part of the sin problem. We all need a savior. So if you think all my kids need is love, all I need to do is give them what they want, make them happy, then you're going to be very disappointed in your life, aren't you? Somebody used this model for parenting. There are a lot of models out there, but this, this is a good one. Uh, breaks the parenting phase up into four parts. There's first, the, when they're little bitty, the discipline phase, zero to five years old. Now, discipline is not punishment, but it might include punishment, but it's discipline, really. Discipline. And when, when they're a little bitty kid, you have to tell them who's in charge, right? Now, I know sometimes there are kids, three and four, who think they're in charge, and sometimes it looks like they are in charge. Mom and dad, this is where you have to set the boundaries. You have to s establish their guidelines. I've read psychologists say that kids who are under five years old have already developed their personality traits, their inclinations, and so many other attributes that's going to just be more and more developed in their life. Before they reach the age of five, now that's tough, especially if you're, you're in a situation like I'm in. My wife and I, who we uh, have adopted over the last uh, few years, uh, two preteen children who didn't have our discipline in their life, 
when they were 0 to 5 or 0 to 12. And it's tough. It is very tough reinforcing discipline that is normal to me as a Christian father on children who didn't have it at all. So if you're in that situation, it's hard work. And you can talk to my wife. The last two years have been very tough and trying and exhausting. We thought we were great parents until then. It's, it's hard to parent a child that doesn't have your genetics. It is. And it, it, you can talk to Steve Harley. He adopted his daughter when she was a baby. But it's still hard because they don't share the same genetics. It's tough. But you got to discipline them. you got to train them. 5 to 12 years old, you're, you're telling them, hey, this is, this is what you got to do. Here's how we do this. Here's why we do this. And it's training. And then there's coaching. <clears throat> and that's when they're teenagers. Now, when they're teenagers, there may have to be some discipline and some training, especially, as I said, if they're adopted in. There might still have to be some training and, and uh, discipline. So 12 to 18 years, you're coaching them, and then you get to that point to where they're going out of the house and you, you put on this big show like you're crying and like you're sad about it and then they leave the house and you're like yeah and um, not really honey we didn't do that but you're friends with them how many of you can honestly say you're friends with your parents you're friends with your parents okay it's a wonderful thing it's a wonderful thing that's what we parent for and then we're watching them thrive and 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 one day parent their own children and be great parents. Now listen, I, I forgot to say something a while ago. <clears throat> when we moved here, it was so that my wife, I mean the, the church was a big part of why we moved here, but my wife didn't have to work. And I just want to say a word, because I said this last service earlier, and I just want to say a word. If you're both working, if you can, one of you stay home with that child, I just want you to hear me say, from a pastoral perspective, you should do that. You should do that. If you can do that, you should do that. I know it might, you might have to get rid of a vehicle, or you might have to, uh, you know, sacrifice uh, maybe some vacation time, or, 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 or that new this or new that you were going to get, but if you can do it, you should do it. I, I promise you, I promise you, you will not regret that decision. I don't know anybody that's ever said, I, I wish I'd never stayed home with my kids. Now, it could be mom or dad. My opinion is that mom would be better. Your mom has that natural nurturing instinct about her. And uh, dads would kill the babies, I think. You know, they would, they would lose it or something, you know. It would end up in the dryer or something. Uh, no, I, I really think if you can, if you can stay home with your child, you should now. I love our daycare. We have great daycare workers. I, I love to see these, uh, uh, you know, the, the young ladies over here and some who aren't so young who take care of these babies and these children. And I just wonder, you know, I know these parents would love, if they could, to stay home with those children. I'm just saying, if you can, I mean, push yourself to try to stay home. From a pastoral perspective, it is the absolute best advice I could give you as a parent. You will not regret it. You will not regret it. So, this is a great, uh, this is a great uh, model here that we can learn from. Now, when it comes to discipline, I think there are three reasons to discipline your children. And this is at any age, especially when they're younger, before they're 18. If, if there is disobedience, you should discipline them. If you say this and they do that, if you say don't do this and they do that, there's willful disobedience. Now, if they do this and you didn't tell them this was wrong or you didn't tell them they shouldn't do this, then you know, maybe you could say you could use some common sense, but you might need to let them off the hook a little bit. But if it's willful disobedience, you have to discipline them. If there's dishonesty, you have to discipline them. You can't accept that. If they're going to be dishonest about who they were with last night or where they were or what time they came in, you're not going to be able to trust them with bigger things. And if there's disrespectfulness, now I think today this third one is the problem. I think there are a lot of parents who have just taken this off the, off the uh, discipline chart. Okay, I'll discipline for disobedience and dishonesty, but I'll let my kid talk back to me. I'll let my kid mouth off to me. And I'll tell you, this is tough because it starts small and it gets bigger, but we cannot stand for disrespectfulness. 
disrespect comes in more than just the mouth. It comes in how they act. And listen, parents, I want to tell you something. You're not their friends. You're not even being a parent if you don't discipline them when they are disrespectful to you. And what we've got going on in our culture today, I think, is a, lot, is a, is a generation who, uh, who doesn't know the value of respect for people in their life. So, uh, that's when you should discipline. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of lies. There's a whole lot of other lies, but I just love this verse. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. One last one. Some people believe the church has primary responsibility for training their kids in the Christian faith. Now, you know that's not true, don't you? I want to read you what Paul Washer said. He said, your children go to a public school and they'll be trained for somewhere around 15,000 hours in ungodly secular thought. And then they'll go to Sunday school and they'll color a picture of Noah's Ark. And you think that's going to stand against the lies that they're being told? Now, I don't believe our children's ministry and our student ministry are just drawing pictures of Noah's Ark. But I want to tell you, the amount of time that your kids are in church, statistically, church members come to church two to three times a month. Two to three times a month. So that means your kids aren't in church. So you can count back from the hours that your kids are even in church. There's no way that what the church is doing can be the primary training and defense for your children. Here's the truth. The truth is that parents are primarily responsible for their kids' spiritual training. Church can't do it. We can't do it. If we had the most awesome children's ministry, whatever that means to you, it still wouldn't be enough. And we do have a great children's ministry and student ministry, but it's still not enough. You've got to take, uh, you've got to take responsibility. Psalm 78, 2 through 4 says, I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from old. Things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Parents, it's on you. You've got the tough job. If you're doing this parenting thing by yourself, it's even tougher. You just got to work that much harder. If you're in a blended family, it's that much tougher. It's that much tougher to work out the details. So I'm just calling you today to, to believe God's truth and walk in it and live your life in such a way that your children will walk in it. Let's pray. God, thank you for your blessing the blessing of being a parent, the blessing of being one of your children. I thank you, God, for all the things you've given to us to equip us. And I pray for these young parents and these parents who are getting older. I ask you, God, just to fill us up with your spirit and the truth that we need to be the people you've called us to be. God, there's no greater joy than to hear that our children are walking in the truth of your word. That's our prayer for each of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up with me. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you're not yourself walking in the truth, it's going to be hard for you to lead your children in that direction. I'm going to call you to respond. If you want to give your life to Christ today, come forward and let us know that. If you need prayer, then uh, come and, and be prayed for. Or maybe you just need to pray as a family or a couple today. You come as we sing this song.